Hello. How are you fine people doing today? <laughs> How are you getting on with being at home and doing your schoolwork? I see someone just mentioned, are they getting tired from the schoolwork? You're getting set. I imagine that must be quite a pain. Yeah, how's everyone doing? All right. Hello, Cuba. No? You want to cry? Oh. Hi. How much work are you being set? I'm really intrigued. I've heard like really, really mixed things. So I heard um, that some people are getting like an hour and a half a day and that's about it. Whereas other people are being set basically to do the entire specification and that's, I don't know, the expectation. And then I've heard from lots of my teacher friends that lots of people are being set work and there's not much of it which is being expected to be like marked or anything or... Yeah, interesting. Too much, none, a lot, loads. Am I going to do year 13? Yes, I will do year 13, but I was going to go over year 12 first, just that made logical sense to me. So much work, seven hours a day, wow. So you're basically doing like the same amount that you would have done if you were at school, right? Not being said much from science subjects, classic. We're being set so much work year 13, they don't expect you to do it. That's really interesting. Yeah, year 13's being set subjects must be really interesting just because you may or may not have an exam. I don't know. Oh yeah, no, no, teachers always think that. Yeah, I think that was something that I used to get really frustrated at when I was a teacher. Like, oh, how can you not learn this one thing? It's so straightforward. And I was like, so I've got four other subjects or three other subjects. Yeah, no, sad, I, or sad, I, however, I, I don't know how to pronounce your name. Tell me how to pronounce your name. Sad, sad, sad. Um, I, I totally understand what you're saying. <laughs> and that's exactly what I used to do. Preparing for very level. Very nice. How are you finding, like, being in control of your learning? Because that must be something new. So this is, like, the expectation when you go to uni, which is a bit strange. And I think I heard the other day, I don't know if any of you guys are uh, applying for Durham University. I'm pretty sure I read the other day that they're trying to cut the contact time of tutors by about 25 to 30 percent or something. So it'd be interesting if any of you go to Durham because this will probably be preparing you for that quite well. Sad. Okay, cool. Thanks, you, Sad. Uh, absolutely terrible. <laughs> I still have work from school today and it's past school hours. That is true, but I'm sure you woke up a bit later. I'm sure you started a bit later. That was like, I don't know, maybe not. Some holidays are very long. So much work. <laughs> Can't really get into a routine. You're in year 13, you didn't finish biology content. Yep, I can see that as being a problem. Yeah, I think by the time I got into year 13, I had come to the conclusion that one of, well, I, my, my year 13 teacher basically left us, uh, or my year 12 teacher left us for biology, which was quite inconvenient since I went on to do biology. Um, so I had to teach pretty much myself most of it at that stage. So I think I just got used to it. I just take myself to the library and stuff. Um, <laughs> Durham's a really good university. It's just interesting. We've started to see that. Uh, right, let's go over the classic questions that everyone asks me every time. So, number one, um, how long is it? Someone has just asked that, which is why it reminded me. This is about an hour, an hour ish, 45 minutes ish, somewhere between those two marks. Um, hopefully, someone who works for my company will send you guys a link to my slides in a few seconds as well, and if they haven't done that already. Um, other standard question is, does this cover all of the specifications? And the same answer as always um, is basically, I'm focusing on the main British ones, right? So um, AQA is the one done by most people. Um, OCR, LXLA, LXLB are the four big boys in the UK. So I'm focusing on them. The ones like CIE and International LXL and all that sort of stuff, um, I will be kind of covering some of it, but I'm not focusing on it. So I do take exam questions from them, but it's not like I've taken their specifications and gone, right, so I'm going to take that, and I'm going to go over that. It's more just like I'll conveniently go over quite a lot of that stuff too. Cool. So you feel like my school is the only one not doing video learning with a teacher. Uh, Zay, the school where I used to work definitely don't do that. I think it's more of an American thing from what I've gathered, but I don't know. Will there be a webinar on population size? Um, at some point, I will definitely do some questions on it. Yes. Yeah, I, I definitely get the impression that not many teachers have been using Zoom or have been using YouTube or, I don't know, Google Hangouts or whatever, whatever you guys have been told to use. So I don't think you're alone now. Uh, awesome, there you go. There's a presentation too. 
So we're going to be covering uh, cell structure and uh, viruses as well as so, uh, as well as like prokaryotes too. So prokaryotes, eukaryotes, and viruses. Um, some of the things we're going to cover today. Okay. So starting. Uh, oh, before I say that as well, um, as always, there is a one-time code at the very very end of this session. I know it's always a one-time code, but they I think they run out at like midnight tonight or something. So I'll have a coupon code for you at the very, very end if you are remotely interested in Snapprovise, if you're enjoying these videos. Um, but if not, that is your choice. But starting nice and easy. So starting nice and easy. Um, the diagram below shows a typical animal cell as seen using an electron microscope. Obviously, this is not a real picture. That is an image that someone has drawn. Um, name the organelles labeled A, B, and C shown on the diagrams. What do you guys think? So two answers so far, two different answers. Most of you are going for the same frame. Yeah, A is the rough endoplasmic reticulum. Great word. Okay, so just a top tip, don't write R-E-R. -E right? Everyone always likes to do that, definitely do not do that. Um, it doesn't, people won't necessarily assume you know what you're talking about if you've just written R-E-R. -E so rough endoplasmic reticulum. Um, I know that because it's got all these little ribosomes on it, making it really clear that it's definitely not a smooth endoplasmic reticulum. Um, B then, lots of you are saying the same thing. I don't think anyone was saying anything particularly different here. So B is definitely the mitochondria. which I can tell it apart from, well, I can tell that it's not a chloroplast because firstly it's told me it's an animal cell and I imagine loads of you missed that. Um, but basically these, these little kind of bulges and these little sort of folds around the outside, um, they are the cristae, right? And they look complete, or the cristae aren't at all in the chloroplasts, but the similar structure in the chloroplasts, um, the phylicoids, they're sort of stacked up and that's how you can tell that this is definitely a mitochondria and not a chloroplast. Uh, C then, C, yes, lots of you guessing right. So C is not the nucleus. That's what everyone always uh, says if they haven't studied this very well. This whole structure here is a nucleus. Um, so C is the nucleolus. If there are any year 11s watching this, um, apologies. Essentially, you're going to find out quite soon if you do A-level biology that there are quite a few organelles that you've never heard of and you're going to have to learn them. But it's not too bad. So yeah, that is the nucleolus. Okay, there'll be some questions later about what they do, I believe. Um, what are the other things? What is uh, D? D is easy. What is F? What is F? Hey, you see me. Yeah, yeah, B was a mitochondrion, yeah. Yeah, good. I'd say either a lysosome or a vesicle or something like that. Um, G, any ideas what G could be? Yeah, V schools and lysosomes you definitely couldn't tell apart, so either of those would be fine. G? No, G is definitely not a ribosome. Ribosomes are these really tiny little dots, so they're the ribosomes. mRNA, yeah, I'd say it's a centriole because you've got. Um, because they're basically at a 90 degree angle to one another, they look like centrioles to me. H, what's H? mRNA, you definitely cannot see. So G is a centriole. So centrioles being the uh, vaguely important things in spindle formation um, during mitosis and stuff. So they basically move to opposite ends of the nucleus, or whatever nucleus once was, and they are involved in microtube production. Yeah, H is the Golgi apparatus, which, uh, in the textbook I had when I was your age, it said it looked like naan bread stacked on top of each other, which is a bit weird. I think it looks a lot more like the Wi-Fi signal. That's what I've always thought. But yeah, H is definitely the Golgi apparatus. Awesome. Um, okay. Oh, there, there are a few other things that we could feasibly be talking about here, but I don't think I can really see them. Uh, okay. So which organelle A to D is not involved in the production and secretion of enzymes in eukaryotes? How can you tell a Golgi and smooth endoplasmic reticulum apart? Um, the smooth endoplasmic reticulum tends to be pretty close to the nucleus and the uh, rough endoplasmic reticulum. They do look similar. 
Yeah, so sorry, which one of these is not involved in the uh, production secretion of enzymes in eukaryotes? Good, you guys are right. So smooth endoplasmic reticulum. What does the SER do? Yeah, good. So, <coughs> oh, it's because it's like my friend. Um, the SER is involved in sort of lipid synthesis and production. So it does a lot of stuff to do with lipids. which if any of you guys have done the weird topic in AQA biology where you have to learn about chylomicrons, that's why the SER is important at some point. Uh, but yeah, lovely. Um, okay, so the bacterium, oh, I don't know how to pronounce this, Sorangium, I guess, cellulosum. So Sorangium, the bacterium, Sorangium cellulosum, and the fungus Armillaria miliae are both found in soil. Yeah, let's just ignore the names and go for bacteria and uh, fungus. So S cell and a mel. Oh, that's nice. S cell and a mel. Um, okay, so which of the rows A to D correctly shows the structures present in each organisms? In each organism. Um, synthesis of carbohydrates. <laughs> I prefer, I would prefer to just be talking about lipids with the uh, endoplasmic, uh, the smooth endoplasmic reticulum. I think carbohydrates are somewhat involved, but it's just less important. But yeah, um, I know some specs probably do add carbohydrates to it as well. Okay, so we've got to be thinking then, um, do both bacteria and um, fungi, do they both have ribosomes? Uh, which one has a nucleus, which one has DNA in a single loop, and which one has a cell wall? So most of you are going for A, some of you are going for B. That's a good point, Sard. So it's got to be A. Okay, so um, free ribosomes, do they both have ribosomes? Do they both do protein synthesis? Yes, absolutely must do. So it's got to be one of those, so it can't be that one easy and it can't be that one. Um, they're both good. Uh, membrane bound nucleus. So we know that a bacteria definitely doesn't have a nucleus, only uh, amel, only fungi. DNA in a single loop. Um, well, bacteria definitely have a loop. Um, whereas, yeah, fungi definitely have a nucleus, so it can't be that. So it's got to be this one. And just to check, cell wall present. Uh, yes, fungi have a cell wall. What is the cell wall of a fungus made from? What is the cell wall of the bacteria made from? How do you pronounce that word without swearing? I spent a very long time trying to work out how to pronounce that word. I guess it's quite hard for me to ask you how to pronounce it. Yeah, it's chitin, yeah. So chitin is what you find in fungi. Um, you also find it in insects as well. So their exoskeleton is made out of chitin, which is a bit weird. It's like quite strange. They both use the exact same material, despite being so evolutionarily different. Um, bacteria, as you guys seem to know, um, there are two words that you can learn, and they're both basically acceptable. You can either learn murine, which is what people seem to prefer because it's easier to spell, um, or you can learn peptidoglycan. And you might have just heard that my Alexa just did something interesting. <laughs> There you go. So peptidoglycan or murine, um, they are what basically make up the cell wall of a bacteria. It doesn't matter which way around, um, sorry, it does matter which way around you see these, but bat, um, bacteria being murine or peptidoglycan, it doesn't matter. Or peptidoglycan, you can say it like that as well if you want to. Good word. Definitely a good word for Scrabble. Not that you'd ever be able to spell a Scrabble with like five letters. That was a stupid thing to say. Ignore me. Um, okay, so which of the options A to D occurs in the nucleus of a cell? Have you ever covered the nitrogen cycle? Yes, I have, but not right now. As much as I love the nitrogen cycle. So which of the options A to D occurs in the nucleus of a cell? I've just realized I actually haven't got any of the mark schemes up yet. This is all been off the top of my head, guys. You've, you've been treated so far. Now let's make sure I'm not saying something stupid. Uh, okay, which of the options? A to D occurs in the nucleus of a cell. Make sure you're saying B. You'd be correct. So what? What? why is it the case that synthesis of mRNA is going on in the nucleus? What is that sort of alluding to? Okay. 
Yeah, so some of my transcription. Okay, so enzymes, obviously we know are made in the endoplasmic reticulum or some ribosomes are free floating in the cytoplasm. Uh, modification, um, we know that that is going on in um, the Golgi and then synthesis, we know that that's all going on in the uh, chloroplasts. Okie dokie. Um, so the electron mic micrograph below shows a Golgi apparatus in part of the cell. What a nice picture. Using information from the electron micrograph, explain how this organelle can be identified as a Golgi apparatus. Ooh. Namrasa, well done for remembering the name of that structure. Everyone always forgets that one. So what else have we got? Yes, cisternae are the fold, you are spot on. Uh, yet they are sort of flattened or stacked, that will get you a mark if you were to say that. In fact, will it? No, I actually just lied to you. You won't get a mark for that, sorry. It looks like a Wi-Fi structure. <laughs> um, Golgi vesicles, yes. So these guys here, um, you can see sort of budding off the end. That is another good way of working out the difference. That's a terrible color. Um, if you're looking for the difference between um, the Golgi and the endoplasmic reticulum, um, lots of these little vesicles are a nice way to say that this is probably the Golgi because you have vesicles which are going to bud off all the time. Um, anything else we could say? How do we know that it's, what's another bit of evidence that it's not endoplasmic retic reticulum? It's interesting that this is a mark. So, um, presence of cisternae. It's another good word, I like that one. Not Christe. Which of the ones that you find uh, in your mitochondria? So yeah, no, no ribosomes. That is another bit of uh, sorry. No ribosomes is another bit of evidence that this isn't something like the endoplasmic reticulum. So the lack of something can be evidence for something being something else. So the presence of cisternae, um, we could say um, lack of ribosomes. Uh, we could say vesicles. Um, what else can we say? It being membrane bound, I don't think that's too important. Curved or flattened, they wrote in the mark scheme, which is interesting. Especially when they seem a bit like antonyms of one another. Um, but yeah, this sort of curved structure that sort of looks, again, kind of like a Wi-Fi signal. Um, that is evidence that you are looking at the Golgi apparatus. Again, I need to change colour. So it's sort of really curved here. And then it sort of becomes flatter and then a bit more curved out this way. Um, again, that is a, uh, is a sort of standard structure that you see um, when you're looking at the Golgi apparatus. Yeah, cisternae, sorry. Um, they're like the little folds. So the things that I was taught look a bit like naan breads are called cisternae. So the membrane are the cisternae. Or the, sort of the structure that looks a bit like that. They are, they are cisternae. What did you have to say about the vesicles? Um, all I've got in my mark scheme is uh, presence of, sorry, la <sighs> presence of vesicles around the outside is evidence that these are, um, this is part of the Golgi apparatus. Also called the Golgi body as well, in case you've heard that. You're going to remember naan bread now as well. Naan bread is one of those great words, isn't it? Where uh, it means bread, bread. And naan, I'm pretty sure is, um, I don't know which of the Indian languages it is, but I'm pretty sure naan in that language means bread. It's like chai tea means tea tea. If you've ever seen um, somewhere, if something in, in English ends with the words ham, it's like the old, it's like the old fashioned word for hill. And there are loads of places around uh, the UK which are called like ham hill, which means hill hill. Very stupid. How do we know it has ribosomes? Um, no, it doesn't have ribosomes. So in your endoplasmic reticulum, you have this sort of structure that looks a bit like this. And it's always connected to the nucleus. And it's got lots of very, very dense, dark patches on the outside. And basically, those guys are your ribosomes. Ham, ham. Yeah, it's a weird one. I think there's a few more examples of those where things are named twice. There, I'm pretty sure there's another word for hill as well, which I read about. And basically, whenever a new person came to conquer the UK, they gave it its old name for a bit, and then they changed it to the new name too. 
So I'm pretty sure there's a place in English which is translated as hill, hill, hill. Yeah, I know, I know SER doesn't have ribosomes also, but in, in working out, this question isn't saying how can I tell that it's not the SER, it's just saying how do I know it's for Golgi? And that is some of the evidence there is. So remind me what cystinase is. Yeah, they're just these sort of um, structures. So in the same way that the, um, the chloroplasts are made up of thylakoid membranes and they have uh, grana is like the name for the stacks. Um, same thing with um, the Golgi. Basically, the stacks of these membranes are called cisternae as opposed to grana or thylakoids. Oh, I don't doubt for a second that there's a river that translates to river as well. Okay, yeah, it's like ratus, ratus. Yeah, there's, um, I think boa constrictor is the Latin name for a boa constrictor as well. Orangutan, I think, is something quite similar. Maybe not for that one, actually. Right, anyway, describe the role of the Golgi apparatus. So what does this thing do? This thing we've been talking about and get distracted by for the last few seconds. What does the Golgi apparatus do? Processing and modification of proteins. So modify and package uh, good, good. What does that actually mean? Modify and package. Produced lysosomes is also correct. Transporting stuff, yeah, definitely. So yeah, it folds them too. So modifying, um, let's go for some of the things that we normally say. So modify proteins. Basically, it means sticking carbohydrates or lipids on them. So modify modify uh, proteins, that's one of the rules. So modify proteins. Um, oh, you get a mark apparently for saying what that means. So modify proteins, which means um, addition of carbohydrates and lipids. And glycoproteins as well, apparently. That's really stupid, actually, because that, that means that it, no, ignore that. That means that a carbohydrate has been added. Um, so it, it, it adds carbohydrates and lipids. Um, it packages, which means that it puts them into vesicles. So it packages proteins into vesicles. You get another mark if you say what the purpose of that is. What's it called when you remove a vesicle from a cell that's contained something? Yes, most proteins require some additional pro um, things on it. Good. So it packages proteins into vesicles for exocytosis, which uses ATP. Um, lovely. And also the generation of lysosomes. Nice. Pick basically four of those and you will get your full marks up. Okay. Um, okay, complete table below. If the organelle can be present, and be careful of this, can be present, place a tick um, in the box. And if the organelle could not be present, place a cross in the box. So starting here, um, do I get centrioles in prokaryotic cells? Do I get them in eukaryotic cells? Lysosomes are basically little vesicles that contain hydrolytic enzymes. So basically imagine it as a vesicle, but it contains an enzyme in it that can digest things. Um, and an example of that is um, lysosome. Anyway, so prokaryotic, no, yes, good. So prokaryotic do not have centrioles, eukaryotic do indeed have. So centrioles being the, the things involved in mitosis, right? Prokaryotes don't do mitosis. Flagella. Flagella, we're thinking yes, no. Yes, maybe, yes. Yes, no. No, then yes. Yes, some. Read question. Yes, 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 no. Read question. Yeah, so both of these are yes. Okay. Not all prokaryotes have a flagellum. Not all eukaryotes have flagellum. Most of them don't but some of them do, and it said can be present, okay? If it says can be present, um, then it's got to be a yes. Golgi apparatus, sperm cells exactly. Asio Leia, is that a Harry Potter thing?
So yeah, it can also cause folding as well, Anand. Okay, good. So lots of you seem to know that prokaryote bacterial cells, um, they do not have membrane bound organelles. It's one of the key differences, right? So presence of a nucleus, they don't have that. Um, no membrane bound organelles and they're smaller. Whereas this is a yes. And then finally ribosomes. Lysosomes are the organelle, lysozymes are an enzyme. Yes, yes. Lovely. Oh, there's more Harry Potter things. Resurrection stone has turned up too. Nice. Cool. Right. Nice. Well done, guys. This one is guessing a little harder. So the diagram shows part of a prokaryotic cell. Name the structures labeled, labeled W to Z in the diagram. What do you think? What do the last point mean? Ribosomes. Ribosomes are just the things that do protein synthesis. Both all, all cells have ribosomes. The only thing that doesn't is a virus. This was on your mock. Oh yeah, I know. This is um, this is a horrible question. People hate this one. The last, last one. Golgi apparatus. What do you mean by that? Generation of lysosomes. There's nothing more to say about that. The last point about lysosomes was I was just saying that um, Golgi apparatus or Golgi bodies produce lysosomes. That's it. Myelin sheaf? No. Right, okay, so one that I've definitely seen people answering right. So Z is definitely a flagella. Good. Um, they could arguably be pili as well, but flagella seems good for now. Uh, w is what? Good. So be careful with this. I would try and be pedantic if I saw this question. So I would say it is the cell surface membrane, right? It has a specific name, the one on the outside, and it is the cell surface membrane. All the other ones, the other membranes, are all called plasma membranes. But the one on the surface is the cell surface membrane. Okay, I'm, I would be pedantic with it if it were me. Um, X and Y. So some of you are saying that Y is um, a capsule. Okay, what does that leave X to be? Good, well done. So um, X is the cell wall. Whoops. And that makes Y um, the capsule. So not all bacteria have a capsule, um, just some of them do. And this is to hide antigens to a degree. So there's this like slimy coat on the outside of it, which makes sure that the antigens aren't really easily detected. That's weird, I got the same question twice. All right, ignore that. Um, name the main biological molecule in W. There isn't really a difference. You'll get different enzymes on um, the plasma membrane and the cell surface membrane. That's about it, really. Monday and Wednesday of sessions, Emily, Emil. Okay, uh, you don't get the mark in W for saying lipid. Yes, very good. W, you would definitely get a mark if you said that it is a phospholipid. That is entirely what it is, 100%. It's not just a lipid, it's a phospholipid. Uh, X. X is definitely murine. Or peptidoglycan or pep peptidoglycan, however you want to say it. I've wrote, and then name a process which prokaryotic cells divide by. Phospholipid bilayer is like, hang on. No, viruses do not have capsules. They have something called a capsid instead. This is indeed binary fission. This is how your uh, mitochondria and your chloroplast, not your chloroplast, will divide as well. Um, okay, um, someone mentioned here uh, phospholipid bilayer. Right, be careful with stuff like this because if it's asking you for a molecule, you just need to keep it as that. Bilayers are sort of the structure that they form. It would be like, I don't know, if, if you had a Lego house and you said, what is this made of? And you said it's made of Lego houses. It doesn't really make sense. It's made of Lego. So the phospholipid is the single 
um, phosphate group attached to two uh, fatty acid tails with glycerol somewhere in the middle. Right, so that is a phospholipid. A phospholipid bilayer is where you get that sort of structure um, where you have lots of tails in the center because they're all, uh, they have the same phobicity, they're all hydrophobic, uh, and all the heads are on the outside because they're all hydrophilic. Can you say carbohydrate instead of peptidoglycan? No, you cannot say uh, carbohydrate here. How do you know this is a bacterium? Okay, it tells me on the top that it's a prokaryote. Which organelles divide by binary fission? Chloroplasts and uh, bacteria. So chloroplast bacteria, chloroplast and mitochondria. So in case you've never come across this, um, there is a nice little story. I love story time. Uh, that basically goes along with how chloroplasts and mitochondria came into existence. And Ed XLB cover it, but no one else really does. So once upon a time, there was this nice little cell um, called a, well, it's very similar to a cyanobacteria that lives today, but a nice little green um, cell, right? A couple of days after it's had, it's had this like, nice little day, it's doing its photosynthesis, having a great time. Uh, unfortunately, this massive old cell decides that it's going to come and engulf it. Okay, This massive old cell that decides to engulf it, um, it does something clever though. It realizes that, well, it doesn't realize, instead of digesting it, it just leaves it there. So as opposed to this cell looking like this, I now have a cell that has the um, chloroplast in the middle and then the whole big bit around it, right? So I've now got this sort of, I don't know, this, let's color this in a bit. I've now got this new cell, which has this nice little chloroplast in the middle, which is green. So this new cell has just worked out a way that it doesn't actually need to eat anymore because it's now got a, a photosynthetic plastid, is what these things are called, inside of it. So essentially that happened, and that is the ancestor of all living plants today. Um, equally for our cells, uh, once upon a time, there was this nice little cell that existed, which was basically a mitochondria. Uh, they're called purple ancient bacterium. And uh, another cell went to engulf it, didn't eat it all the way, didn't digest it all the way. And now all of our cells have a little cell inside of us, which are mitochondria. So the mitochondria and the chloroplasts um, are descended from old cells that were engulfed by another cell. Um, and that's called the endosymbiotic theory. I like that. <laughs> yes, why well don't you guys say endosymbiotic? Do we need to know the process of binary fission? Not really. Um, binary fission essentially works whereby the, the DNA copies itself. So you end up with two identical little loops of DNA. It sort of goes to the far ends of the cell and then the cell just separates itself. That's pretty much it. Yeah, there's not a whole lot to it. Is that why mitochondrial RNA exists? Um, well, the mitochondria and the chloroplasts, they have DNA entirely of their own. So yeah, if you've never... Um, been taught this because your teacher decided that they didn't know it or they didn't want to because <laughs> you might have been behind or something. Um, yeah, there is DNA that exists in the chloroplasts and the mitochondria. Um, and really interestingly, some of that DNA from the chloroplast has actually moved out of the um, chloroplast and has moved to the actual nucleus. Scientists are a bit confused why it's done that, but it's given the nucleus more control over the chloroplast, which is interesting. Um, I think Rubisco might be one of those enzymes as well. I'm not sure. Rubisco is either one that stayed or one that went left. But um, yeah, so some of that DNA migrated, which is interesting. But yeah, there is DNA in, inside of your cell. Do you not know this as well? Uh, inside of your cells, um, your mitochondria have DNA. And all of the DNA in your mitochondria is your mother's. So none of your father's DNA will be in your mitochondria, only your mother's. Apart from a few special cases where it has gone the other way. One of the key ex exceptions to this is uh, there are some trees in America called giant redwoods or giant sequoias. They have paternal uh, mitochondrial inheritance, which is bizarre. Um, do capsules and capsules have the same functionality? Kind of. Um, a capsule is more sort of, I don't know actually what a capsule is made of. It's, it's often called a slime coat as well, whereas capsids are almost just protein. So ancestry kits only check your mother's ancestry. If they were looking at your mitochondrial DNA, then yes. But if they're looking at your genome, then no. So it's only your mitochondria that is purely from your mother in terms of DNA. So if your mother has a mitochondrial disease, you will have a mitochondrial disease. And that's why there are some things in the news a few, maybe a year ago, where they were trying to move about uh, mitochondrial DNA to try and fix people. 
is paternal DNA an advantage? No. To be fair, the, the DNA in a mitochondria just does respiration. So the number of alleles for it is going to be fairly small. Why only from your mother? I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. It's a weird one. Anyway, um, so the table shows features of mitochondrion and chloroplasts. Complete the table with ticks where a feature is present. This is a nice, straightforward question in my mind. Um, okay, first one, double, double outer membrane. What is that found in? Yes, so both of these have an outer membrane, right? This outer membrane, why is there two membranes, I hear you ask? It's because, uh, as I said, once upon a time, it got engulfed by another cell, and when these two ends come together, oh look, there's now one membrane there, one membrane there. That's why there's two membranes. Um, so mitochondria and chloroplasts both have double outer membranes. The nucleus also does as well. Um, there is, uh, some people think that the nucleus could have been something like this as well, I believe unless I'm old with my science because I haven't been at uni for a few years. Um, okay, starch grains are found where? So no, yes, exactly. Yep, starch is found in chloroplasts. Um, this is like a really standard question where you'll have a chloroplast that looks like this, right? And it's joined up to all the other little phylicoids, the little grana, and then there'll be like this weird shape thing over here, which is like really dense. And it'll be like, what's that weird shaped thing over there that's really dense? And it is starch. So chloroplasts build up a load of starch to do in photosynthesis. Um, which one of these two has diffusion of oxygen into the organelle? So what one does oxygen diffuse into? Yeah, well done. So yes, it diffuses into mitochondria. No, it diffuses out of chloroplasts. So mitochondria need oxygen for ATP. Uh, generation for oxidative phosphorylation, chloroplasts, um, they are going to, on the whole, not always, but yeah, always, they are going to always make oxygen uh, from water, from uh, photolysis. So yeah, well done. Uh, okay, this one will definitely separate uh, the youngsters from the, the wise. So complete the table to show the features of uh, a bacterium and a virus. Put a tick in a box if the feature is shown. Um, so which of these two have a cell surface membrane? Uh, Meloplast, um, they yeah, they would still store starch. You're right, Libby. So there are a whole load. If you Google at some point plastids, right, there are a whole load of other organelles that you've never been taught about, um, and ameloplasts are one of them. Oh, I'm intrigued. I knew this one would get me. Always does. Okay, so definitely. Whoops. However, viruses do not have a cell surface membrane. If you look at a virus, um, classic structure being something like this, where that's the capsid. Sometimes they've got a little envelope around their outside, not always. And then they've got like attachment proteins as well. Or they might have attachment proteins on here or something. They will be there actually, they won't be on the outside of that. Um, here is my like standard virus structure, right? If they don't have a cell surface membrane. Um, which of these have nuclei? This is year 12, I'd say. Good. Neither have a nucleus. Well done. Um, bacteria have no organelles, really, or none at all. Um, cytoplasm, which ones have cytoplasm? What spec is this particular question from? If I'm totally honest, I don't actually know. So I have about four specs open when I do this. I've got edXL A, B, OCR, AQA, CIE, and International. And I pretty much pick and choose randomly. I'm like, oh, I'll pick some from there, some from there. I don't actually remember where this one came from. Okay, so only virus has, okay. So most of you are saying both, some of you are saying yes, no. So bacteria, definitely. Uh, viruses, no cytoplasm. None at all. So they do not have a cytoplasm. They have this weird structure where at their most basic level, a virus is just made up of protein on the outside um, and on these like little proteins here, uh, the little attachment proteins, and some form of nucleic acid. Right? I think we like to assume that all of this space here, that this must be cytoplasm, but it's not. They just don't have cytoplasm. Yeah, they're just really weird. Cytoplasm is what you find in cells, and they're not cells. 
I think that's the main thing you've got to think with viruses, right? We say that they are acellular, right? And a before a word means sort of without, like the word atheist. Um, acellular basically means it doesn't, it's not a cell. It's not made of cells. Therefore, everything you knew about cells just throw out the window because it's, it's just not the same. So they don't have cytoplasm, don't have ribosomes. They are made of some nucleic acid and some protein. And sometimes um, when they exit cells, they will steal a little bit of the lipid as well, some of the phospholipids to make a something called an envelope, which is why you hear of some uh, viruses being enveloped because they've got an envelope. Does abiotic mean you don't move then? Abiotic means not living. So what's inside the space? I think it's fairly empty. I think it's just packed with DNA. Be lots of enzymes in there. If it's if it's RNA, there'll be things like reverse transcriptase. But yeah, there won't be won't be loads. Uh, capsid, right? Final one. Um, bacterium. They have a capsule. They do not have a capsid. A virus has a capsid. So bacterium capsule. Virus capsid. Okay, so the capsid is another name for a protein coat. Okie dokie. Right, final question, I believe. Oh, no, maybe one after this as well. Yeah, one after this too. Okay, so when HIV infects a human cell, the following events uh, occur. So a single stranded length of, of HIV DNA is made. Okay, the human cell then makes a complementary strand of the HIV DNA. Okay, the complementary strand is made in the same way as a new complementary strand is made during semi-conservative replication of human DNA. Describe how the complementary strand of HIV DNA is made. Uh, Caitlin, they have to use another cell. So they have to land on another cell. Whoa. No, Okay, I don't know why it's upside down, but it's upside down. So that's, that's called a T4 bacteriophage, that one. Um, and it will inject its DNA in or its nucleic acid. And then it uses the cell machinery of that cell to make DNA. So, okay, um, I've got this. I've got my HIV DNA is made. The human cell then makes a complementary strand. So talking about helicase, um, something like that needs to be used. Yes, I agree. So DNA helicase. Oh, actually, no, don't need helicase. Think about what the question is asking. The question is saying that a single strand of DNA is made. Right. The human cell then makes a complementary copy. So here is my complementary copy. Right. The complementary strand is made in the same way as complementary um, strands made in semi-conservative replication. However, if I'm starting off with something which is already single-stranded, then I don't need to bother with DNA helicase. So don't worry about helicase. What happens next? What happens next? So I've got this single strand of DNA. Three DNA nucleotides bind to the single strand by complementary base pairing rule rules, forming hydrogen bonds. Now, Marissa, that is incredible. So we want to say that um, three floating or just three nucleotides or just nucleotides is fine. Bind to the complementary partners. Okay, now, whenever you say that with a DNA or RNA question, you tend to get marks for saying what binds to what. So because it's DNA, I know that A binds to T, and I know that C binds to G, right? I would always name them as well. I'd never be that bold to say A, T, G, C. I'd always say adenine to thymine, uh, guanine to cytosine. Okay, so I've now got these nice little um, nucleic acids, which are bound up to the right side. Uh, do you get marks saying hydrogen bonds? Unfortunately not. I, I think it should be a mark, but it's not. But hydrogen bonds will form between them. There's three between those ones and there's two between those ones. Just is. <laughs> How can HIV DNA be single-stranded? It just was. Um, no, it's, this is because HIV actually has RNA 
right? An RNA um, is reverse transcriptase, which you don't need to know for this question. Um, it turns single-stranded RNA into single-stranded DNA. And then the nucleotides just join together. Anyway, so DNA polymerase links the nucleotides. DNA polymerase links them in condensation reactions to form peptide bonds. Oh, Libby, you were very, very close there, but you messed up slightly at the end. Uh, I wouldn't mention five, well, you could do if you wanted to. It will go from a five prime to a three prime direction. So um, you're right to get the enzyme. So DNA, not RNA, DNA, and that is a mistake everyone makes all the time. DNA polymerase, then I would word this, and I always word it the same way, and I've just got in the habit of saying it each time. DNA polymerase catalyzes this, um, the condensation reactions between nucleotides forming what's the bond? Phosphodiester bond, well done, Sard. Okay, I, that, that sentence is just stuck in my head because I've said it so many times over the last like four or five years. So enzyme catalyzes the condensation reaction um, between nucleotides forming phosphodiesterbonds. Yeah, if you're talking about any other enzyme like, I don't know, um, ATP synthase or something, ATP synthase catalyzes the condensation reaction between uh, whatever, um, between phosphate groups forming I think they're called phosphate bonds, actually, but that is a bit of a stupid one. No, that is a stupid one to say because you don't know that one. Um, but anyway, you could do it with pretty much any enzyme, right? So amylase will catalyze the condensation reactions between sugars or glucose forming glycosidic bonds or something. Where do peptide bonds form? Um, proteins. How did you make the point it is it's single stranded? I didn't need to make a point it was single stranded. It told me in the exam question it was. DNA ligase is useless question, yes. Um, ester bonds are formed in lipids, phosphodiester bonds are formed in nucleic acids. Although technically, uh, Minty, you might know that if there's just one bond between a phosphate and a sugar, that is actually called an ester bond. It's only when you get two of them and it's called a phosphodiester bond, but that's a bit pedantic and examples will ignore that. Uh, right, final question. Ooh. So uh, organelle X is a mitochondrion, apparently. I don't think I'd be able to guess that from that picture, but there you go. Um, what is a function of this organelle? Ligase comes into DNA synthesis with Okasaki fragments. Good. So function of it, ATP synthesis, what's the process called? I want both to get the mark. So the process of a mitochondrion is ATP synthesis in aerobic respiration or aerobic respiration producing ATP. Right, the number of students I've had over the years who've had a question like this and I've just written respiration. Oh my God, it, it winds me up so much. That is not true because that happens in the cytoplasm. It's aerobic respiration and it makes ATP synthesis. Uh, name organelle Y. Do you need to know about DNA ligase? Uh, you need to know about it in year 13, definitely. Aisha, how does it use glucose to get ATP? That is a whole other session that I definitely am not going to cover in like a minute. <laughs> Google photosynthesis and how it happens. Um, in fact, sorry, Google my respiration, how it happens. Yes, well done, guys. This is the Golgi body or the Golgi apparatus, either or. Lovely. Right. Now, I imagine lots of you are thinking, oh, oh that, was, that was really informative. I did not know that I would learn that much information in such a short amount of time. It's almost, it's almost as if, it's almost as if I've enjoyed myself revising and that's not possible. Well, my friends, um, it is possible. Okay, bear with me whilst I click on something. It is possible, right? And it's possible because of snap revise. 
<laughs> Sorry, I'll stop that now. Um, anyway, yeah. Um, hopefully you guys have found this really interesting. And hopefully you guys are also not feeling too bad about life at the moment. But if you are, and if you genuinely think it sucks that my teachers aren't doing very much at the moment, or my school aren't doing very much, or uh, my school are doing loads, and I'd just like a bit more help, then Snap provides is a very, very good way of doing that. So if I show you what we are basically doing, so I'm doing these three videos twice a week, right? As are, um, as is Georgia doing the uh, chemistry ones and a few other people are doing the maths and the physics ones. Um, however, that is the absolute tip of the iceberg. So if I show you sort of what I normally do, right? My week is um, I do a session on Monday at 10 from 11. Um, I do a session on Tuesday. I do a second session on Tuesday. I do a third session on Tuesday. Um, I then do something on Wednesday. And then I should have something on Thursday, but I haven't put it into my calendar just yet because I forgot to, apparently. Um, as well as that, doing something every day apart from Friday, at least one thing a day. I also do drop-in sessions where people can basically just come up and ask me questions. So look, if I show you this, oh, damn, I can't. Sorry. Um, basically, kids can just ask me questions whenever they want to, right? So here is a drop-in session where I don't know what I went over this time. There you go. I went over some Xerophytes. Someone asked me a question. I went over some exam questions to people. People specifically asked for these questions. Someone asked me about how um, T cells work. Someone asked me about how. Ooh, what's next? Something else. Something else. Definitely did something else this day. There you go, platelets and clots and a cascading thing. Um, basically, um, I do so many sessions all the time, right? If you if you genuinely feel like um, you're struggling a bit, and I totally understand that because I agree that most, most education, um, you're probably capable of doing most, but sometimes you just need that little additional push to get you to the next stage. And that is actually um, a learning theory by someone called Piaget, who came up with that, called the zone of proximal development. But um, if you feel like you need a bit more help, these web classes are very, 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 very useful. And you know who's doing it. I'm doing it, right? Every single one I'm doing. I'm basically um, your teacher, kind of, apart from sat somewhere else. And you can be at home, have a coffee whenever you want. Um, as well as that, as well as that, right? As well as that. Oh, just imagine. Imagine if at school you could just pause your teacher and go and get a coffee and then come back. Imagine that. Um, after that, you could be like, oh, well, I wish I had a few more. Uh, pointers about eukaryotes well look we've got all these videos as well so uh, we literally have I don't know that many videos for some of the topics uh, we have a nice little quiz for you to do so let's say I thought I knew um, eukaryotic cells uh, oh 26 questions basically um, you'd go through this right you'd go through it all and let's say I'm going to quit after that many because I got tired it will basically tell you and it loads up everything in orange the things you don't know so I clearly don't know the mitochondria. So I've got an 11 minute video, which this lovely man's gonna to talk to me about. Um, I'll go through it every time I get to the end of the video, which I probably won't do. It basically goes green and it looks nice and pretty. You get some like XP points up here and stuff like that. It's quite cool. Um, you can do that. If you don't understand a question, I can write, I don't get it mate or something. And I will get a little notification through on my computer saying that Ollie doesn't get it, mate, and I can go and then help them. So on top of that, um, we then have the exam packs where, say I thought this was now quite straightforward and I want to test my knowledge, I could be like, oh, what is Q? I reckon that's a chloroplast. Bam, it is a chloroplast. Uh, we have all these questions with all these solutions that you can have a look at. We've seen how far this page goes as well. Look at that. Ugh. Don't know what this question is. But the answer is a vacuole. Nice. As well as that, we also have revision guides as well. So if you are a bit bored of the revision guide you've got, or if you don't have one, um, basically you get one free with this. So here you go. If you really wanted to, you could download it. There's a button to download it. There you go. Download it, stick it on your wall, whack it wherever you want, and you've got your own like little revision guide that you can do with as you please. Um, I think that's pretty much what we are doing. I don't think there's much else I can show you on here, which is that much more exciting. Um, uh, oh, practicals, mock papers, there you go. So say you're done, there you go. Here's one last little thing, here's a mock paper and someone going through it and telling you all the answers. Um, guys, that is what we are offering. So if you are interested at all, at all, even if you think like, oh, I'll, I'll check it out, see what it's like. And if I hate it, I will never go on it again. 
I really would, I couldn't recommend it more. Like the more contact time you get, it's got to be for the best, right? The more, the more you can have a teacher and I am a teacher, like I've got a PGC, um, I took for four years, the more you can have of just time with the teacher, the better. And frankly, my students I currently have, God, I think they need you. They need you there, right? Just you, right? And that'll make everything better. It means I'll have a better time. I am joking, my students are great. Um, but yeah, if not, and, and it's fine if not, if, if you are feeling like, oh no, it's still still expensive and it is expensive. Um, I think the the cheapest package is like, I think it's about 20-ish pounds um, per month and the more expensive one's about 50 pounds for all those sessions. You are, it is a, it's like a pound per session, I the day. but um, if it's too much, that's fine. Um, you can just check out some more of our videos. So uh, someone is doing one, Oh, that's not coming up. Where are we? Oh, they, okay, it's the American dates, isn't it? Because four first. So someone is doing physics tomorrow at 12 o'clock. Someone is doing chemistry the same day. So two of them tomorrow. Someone's doing math. Someone's, I'm doing my toast again next week. And we're, we're still, we're doing them basically every week, right? So if I haven't sold you, which is fine, I'll keep saying that's fine. If you like, I'm not going to bully you into doing anything. Um, it's fine. Right, just keep going to our videos, check out our videos, like set a reminder or whatever. So at least you've got something, right? At least you can go back to school feeling like you've like done something really, really good. Right, I am gonna leave that there. Does anyone have any questions that they'd like me to try and answer in the next few seconds? I'll stick around for a bit. What were we saying? Great promo. <laughs> oh, there you go, nine pound 99 per month for the basic package. It wasn't 20 pounds, it was nine quid a month. Okay. So when you answer phosphodiesterol bond, and when do you answer phosphodiesterol bond? So if it's a nucleic acid, always say phosphodiesterol bonds. <laughs> Winnie, you have done, you've made the correct choice. Yeah, do the free trial. Why, you, what have you got to lose? And then if you hate it, and you found that you've got more stupid than you were before, which would, wouldn't happen, Sack it off. Oh, discount code. Yes, good point. EUK10, if you want a discount code uh, for £10 off, if I have sold you, uh, here is £10 off. You carry out 10. You might have guessed that there is a bit of a theme with the discount code. That when I did proteins, it was prot 10. When I did sales, it was uk 10. Might be a fun game. You can guess what the discount code is. Do you cover LXLB? Yes, we do cover LXLB. I reckon you look like Jay from the Inbetweeners. Brilliant. I can't really ref like reference anything he's ever said, can I? Because I'm pretty sure I'd get kicked out of my own thing. My profile picture is nothing like you. Um, yeah, that's when I started the job and I had decided that I should probably look more professional and shave. And I had my hair cut, which I haven't had done. My hair is like down to my nose at the moment, which is pretty ridiculous. Um, so yes, I know I look very young there because I shaved. Basically this, which you wouldn't expect, puts about five years on me. Best way to learn most content by Tuesday, have mock on modules one to four. Uh, Freddie Dolan, obviously download stamp providers firstly. Um, secondly, I would say um, you want to make flashcards, or that's probably too late. Uh, you want to do past papers. If you've got a week, past papers, as many as you can do, as many exam questions as you can do. That's, that's your, the only thing you can really do. Cellular respiration, no, aerobic respiration. Definitely aerobic. Can you still use a discount code? Kathleen, I don't actually know, if I'm honest. Do you do OCR A? Is that just not normal OCR? And yes, I was literally young. Do you want to know a weird fact? If you sign up to Snap Revise, I have more of these weird facts. Every single photo of you that's ever existed is always going to be in the past. There'll never be a photo of you in the future. There'll always be in the past. How can you access past papers other than Snap Revise? Uh, just Google online past papers, online A level biology past papers. There'll be about four, four good websites that come up. They're the ones that I use. <laughs> Jake, that is a difficult question, which I'd, I wish you wouldn't ask. But no, I very much doubt it. Well, that'd be an interesting promotion. I feel like that'd be quite a costly promotion on our half. Right, guys, I reckon I'm going to go now. I reckon I've answered most of your questions. 
And if not, you're just going to have to turn up next time. So have a really lovely rest of your day, guys. And I will see you, I don't know, Monday next week? Monday next week. See you later.